Today on Comic Story, and we're going to be covering the 2013 run of Moon Knight. This is the long-going series that people like to talk about all the time as one of the best Moon Knight series. It was written by Warren Ellis, Brian Wood, and Colin Bunn. And it tells a lot of one-off storylines about Moon Knight questioning his faith to Khonshu and basically how the two of them work that out. It does leave you on a little bit of a cliffhanger, but we'll get to the follow-up stuff later. Now, this is the Comic Story and Channel, and this is a full story series. We take all of these videos that we made a long time ago, most of these never even going on the video. These videos are condensed versions of the storylines, where I give you an audio narrative of the core plot line. We cut out a bunch of the extra artwork, we cut out a bunch of the B-plots, and I just tell you the bare bones so that you know what's going on. The purpose of this series is to allow you to go to your local comic book store or to a digital retailer, buy these issues, get more context, more art, if you like it and want to do that. All alterations to the panel's text and images are to prevent copyright problems, and all art is owned by its respective companies. Now, like I said in the intro, this is the Moon Knight series from 2013, written by three different writers, and everyone likes to rant and rave about it. It's a pretty amazing storyline, and it's just a bunch of one-off storylines involving Moon Knight. While it does end on a cliffhanger, there are storylines that popped up in the later years that kind of pick up where this left off, and we'll be covering those at a much later time. And if you end up enjoying this video, please consider giving it a like, but let's celebrate the release of Moon Knight with a Moon Knight full story. Rumors began to circulate around New York of the return of a man, a man named Mark Spector. Mark was a mercenary who caught the bad end of a deal in Egypt and was shot to dead by some of his friends while at a dig site. But he didn't stay dead. You see, he returned because the Egyptian god Khonshu willed it. When Mark returned, he didn't come back alone. Khonshu has four aspects, so Mark returned to the States with three other people. He's completely nuts. He even cut off a guy's face once, or so the rumors go. The mayor created a new sweeper squad to take on homicides, specifically of the unnatural type. So Detective Flint knows Mark Spector, or what people now call Mark Spector by, Mr. Knight. You can always tell when Mr. Knight is out on a case because he drives to crime scenes in a pure white limo with a moon emblem on the front. As Mr. Knight drives in the back of the limo, he tells the car to show him the last four events in incident folder SL2. Also, driver, go to the new event location, Town Speed Park. The driverless vehicle responds with confirmed, and the limo begins to drive. Once Mr. Knight arrives, he puts on his mask, becoming the Moon Knight, or a version of it. And he makes his commanding presence known. As Mr. Knight walks towards the scene of the new murder, one of the officers asks if that is, and Flint tells him that Mr. Knight is just a concerned citizen. The officer stops, going, no, that's Moon, and Flint stops him. No, if that man were identified by the name of a dangerous vigilante known as Moon Knight, then we'd have to follow a very specific set of standing orders and restrain him. So this is a thing that we do, to police the streets. That is Mr. Knight. As Mr. Knight gets closer, Flint tells him that they've got a slasher. Again, one of the first cases that they've ever worked together was a slasher. They should have known that this would bring him out. Mr. Knight kneels down to examine the body of the victim, stating that this isn't that. Slashers are bad enough, attacking people who only want to travel at night, but this one is a little different. The victim's a very strong man. Flint goes on telling him that all of the victims were strong men, bouncers, security, gym rats, and they all have bits cut off of them. Good sharp knife, real Jack the Ripper stuff. Moon Knight looks around the crime scene, stating that the cuts were sharp, but not medical level sharp. The killer is going after a very particular type, but he's not trailing them. This area is a tight spot. It means that the slasher is opportunistic. He watched the victims in probably no more than a day. He was picking them for their size, but he himself is fighting like a wounded soldier. It's an ambush spot. This also means that he isn't far, cutting fresh pieces of human organs, but not going very far from here. One of the officers asks, he? And Mr. Knight tells him, he. Weight distribution, height, and there's something wrong with his heel. The officer says, look, all of this talk is real interesting, but you're not a police officer. You can't just... Moon Knight stops. He stares. You're about to go underground into the hideout of a highly trained killer, which will be where he keeps all of his weapons. I'd prefer to do that part for you, sir. The officer laughs. Ha <laughs> ha, you're crazy. Also, hate to point this out, but you're wearing a white suit, and it's going to stand out. He'd see it coming. Moon Knight buttons, and he straightens his jacket, fixes his tie, and he leaves. That's the part I like. As Mr. Knight leaves, he drives over to a nearby manhole cover and parks. He sees a rope tied to the top rung, stating that this is how he did it. He pulled himself up, hard on the arms, easy on the legs. Well, this is totally a sane thing to do. 
So he climbs down into the sewers, following a blood trail to an old abandoned shield bunker. A voice calls out that they can hear him coming, and Moon Knight asks, Over all the noise, you're running some heavy machinery down here. The man in the shadows laughs. Sure, but these are important machines. Can't hear myself think sometimes, but that's okay. You here to take me out, you armed? Mr. Knight tosses whatever he had in his jacket to the ground, stating, Not anymore. I've come to hear your story. The mutilated man steps forward with a metal false leg, asking, Story? I was a soldier, an agent for S.H.I.E.L.D. I was down here to get better. An IED blew the crap out of me and they wouldn't fix me. Said I wasn't fit for service and threw me out. But look at me now! I found the old medical equipment that they wouldn't use on me because it's not right or illegal. And look how much better I am! Moon Knight asks, So you killed healthy people for supplies? You go up, you hide, you watch, you track fit people, and then you kill them to take pieces of them down here and paste onto your body with obsolete exotic machinery. And this is the best use of their lives in your time and skills? The man laughs. Ha! No offense, but you're a mile underground wearing a white suit and a bag over your head. You're gonna die down here. Mr. Knight tells him, Oh, I've died before. It was boring, so I stood up. The man pulls out a sword asking, Are you supposed to stop me? And Moon Knight tells him, I stopped you two minutes ago. Look down. The man sees a crescent-shaped blade stuck into his mechanical parts, and Mr. Knight goes on telling him, That part looked important. The man lunges with his sword, but Mr. Knight steps back asking, What would this have been like if you had actually fought instead of hiding behind some garbage and stabbing people in the back from cover? The man pulls out a gun, telling him, How about we find out? And as he pulls the trigger, Mr. Knight takes out another moon blade, deflecting the shot, tossing it to the ground, telling him, Not good enough, soldier. And with this mission successfully completed, we go back to before New York. We go back to where this all began. Mark had returned to get help. Maybe he was crazy. Maybe he did have schizophrenia. Maybe Kanchu wasn't an actual being. Turns out he had brain damage upon returning to the world of the living. Raised from the dead by an outer terrestrial entity and made to some extent to be that entity's operation. He was made to be driven by Kanchu's chosen agency to bring vengeance to those who would harm travelers by night. He cycles through four aspects, struggling to define what has happened to him or to everyone. He seeks to apply identities to them. Whether it be Mark Spector, Stephen Grant, Jack Lockley, it doesn't matter. Mark Spector isn't insane. His brain has been colonized by an ancient consciousness from beyond space-time. And later that night, as Mark returned home, he holds his mask, staring at his other selves. But across from them, Conchu sits in a chair. You are my son. In the beginning, there were eight, and then seven, and then six, and then five, and four, and three, and two, and one. And finally, there were none. Eight murders, all shot in the head, shot with bullets that would come from a long-range rifle. Moon and Knight glides over the city until he finds his mark. A sniper positioned on a building. Sometimes, Mr. Knight does things too properly. It's during these times that Moon Knight walks. But as he approaches the sniper on the building, he notices something coming. The sniper hones his shot in his scope and fires an anchor to the next building while looking on the current one. Before jumping, the sniper pulls out a sidearm, but Moon Knight throws a moon blade, cutting it in half. As the sniper throws the broken gun at Moon Knight, he jumps off, catching the wire connected to the next building. Moon Knight follows, gliding over using his cape, but the sniper takes out a second gun, shooting holes through the cape. As he begins to plummet to the ground below, Moon Knight takes out his baton, firing a hook up into the room that the sniper crashed through, pulling himself up. The sniper turns back, bang! He fires a shot, hitting Moon Knight, but Moon Knight throws another moon blade into to the sniper's knee, sending him into the ground. The sniper fumbles to get into position, asking, why can't he hit him? And Moon Knight tells him, because I'm not real. Moon Knight continues dodging the oncoming bullets and throws another moon blade into the sniper's hand. And the sniper scrambles to his feet and runs. Moon Knight quickly uses his baton again to launch his hook into the back of the sniper's back, knocking him down a second time. He then walks up asking, why? And the sniper says, because they left him. They dissolved the company. They left him to die in the field, and they went and got new jobs on Wall Street. They paid him. They used him to change the course of countries and history, and now they help banks. It may not have been a good life, but it was his life, and they took it. So he took theirs. Only one left. 
The sniper kicks, but Moon Knight hits back, knocking him into the next door. The door swings open and a man with a gun is standing there. The sniper looks back and the man shoots. Bang. As the man holds the smoking barrel. He says that there were nine of them in a special operations group. He had a last minute late meeting. He didn't leave work on time. They left the global security field and retired to large financial houses to make money. This man, he was their tool. A gun with the numbers filed off dropped into the street of Beirut or Magdisha or Tripoli. Guns aren't supposed to come back and punish their owners. Perhaps his gamble is what they taught him. Guns are powerful. The distant projection of death is powerful. That's why they changed their careers. They learned differently. The bank always wins. Late one snowy night, a couple walks home when they hear something in the distance. The first man says that it sounds like music from when he was a kid. And the man's boyfriend asks, what, like someone tapping two dinosaur bones together? And the younger man laughs and the older one says, no, it's like a music box. Can't you hear it? Soon the streets are empty and a group of spectral thugs walk towards them and attack. So, the next night, Mr. Knight arrives on the scene stating that the spree hitters appeared for a third time. Who knew that there were still punk gangs, kind of vintage? Mr. Knight gets out of the car and as he swings at one of the thugs, his arm passes through. Mr. Knight pauses for a moment and the specter grabs him by the head, slamming him into the hood of the car. Mr. Knight tries to push him back, but another whips his chain, cutting into his back. The thugs all gather around and begin kicking and beating Mr. Knight until he's left a bloody mess, and then they disappear. Mr. Knight returns to tend to his wounds, telling his other selves that this was different. He couldn't touch them. It doesn't make sense. Khonshu tells him, I know. They are ghosts. You know full well that the angry dead can reach out and touch the living. Mr. Knight tells him, Okay. Fine. Ghosts are randomly attacking people in downtown Manhattan at night. They can touch me, but I can't touch them. What do I do? Sprinkle holy water everywhere? Khonshu tells him. You have collected items from ancient Egypt. You possess all kinds of armor and remnant for fighting the living. How can you not have garments for fighting the dead? Mr. Knight heads into the basement and pries open a box. And when he sees what's inside, he says he doesn't remember buying most of this. Khonshu tells him. Perhaps you weren't supposed to remember. So the next night, Moon Knight heads back to the area where he was attacked, wearing a new set of ancient armor, and this time he swings and he connects. The thug with the chain attacks, but the chain breaks on Moon Knight's armor, and he punches the ghost's arm off. Equipped with a pair of bone knuckle dusters, Moon Knight punches pieces off the ghost, rendering him to a puddle of spectral goo. He then turns to the others, and the ghosts begin to run away. He calls to his glider to give chase, but the ghosts run, phasing through a building under renovation. Moon Knight stops, pulling the tarp to the side, kicking the door in, walking through, ready for another fight. But what he finds is a group of skeletons, all wearing the clothes that the ghosts were wearing. And in the middle of the room sits one with a gun and a music box. He picks up the music box, seeing a crack, and through it, the ghosts are hiding. He turns it upside down and sees a message. Johnny, be good. Love, Mom. Moon Knight looks at the skeleton asking, Are you Johnny? Did you get in an attack of your conscience? It can happen. Did you sit here with a childhood music box, waiting for your fellow gang members to return? Moon Knight then stands up, taking the music box, and he drops it in the river on his way home. Outside the busy Odenburger, a man sits on the side of the road eating his dinner. But as the white limo pulls up, Moon Knight tells him to get in and do not bring the food into the car. As the man gets in, Moon Knight asks, Do you know Peter Oleron, Mr. Skeleton? Skeleton says that he did. He knew that Peter worked with him before his death. He spoke with Detective Flint and said to reach out. Moon Knight asks, How can I help? Skeleton goes on stating that he works in sleep research, and lately all of his patients have been having the same dream, which is impossible and it's driving them insane by inches. Moon Knight asks what kind of sleep research, and Skeleton tells him that sleep is a process that allows the brain to remove toxins from its tissue via the lymphatic system. They study the dream state in relation to the neurotoxin load, protein activation, and lymphatic processing though he wouldn't expect him to know what any of that means. Moon Knight then asks to bring him to the new facility to meet the patients, and Skeleton says that Peter never mentioned what they did together, but he is not qualified to study somnological subjects. 
Moon Knight leans forward, stating that he is precisely qualified. Dreamers are people who travel at night, and that is his specialty. A short drive later, inside a skeleton's lab, he says that all of the patients are gone now until the issue is solved. They were attempting to induce lucid dream states, guiding the dream's physical mechanics through chemical messaging. Everyone was on drips and sensors. Moon Knight looks around the facility and asks, Is there an empty room? And Skeleton tells him that there is one, but it's damp. And if he's being honest, it stinks. God only knows what the previous owners were like. Moon Knight says he'll take it. As Skeleton hands him the key to lock the door from the inside, he says that it occurs to him that he might already be insane, and Moon Knight tells him he feels the same way. Now go to the office. I have work to do. Moon Knight enters the small, damp room, and he lays down. He folds his arms, telling Khonshu that they can hear him. Put him to sleep. Soon the ground around Moon Knight begins to sprout fungus, and Moon Knight falls through into another dimension. His form begins to change, traveling through this mystical fungal world. As he lands, hands begin to reach for him, but Moon Knight just cuts them down. And across the way, he sees a man standing there. The man turns with fungus growing out of his eyes, stating that he can't sleep, he can't wake, he's trapped here. And suddenly, Moon Knight is yanked through the wall and spit into an open field of faces. The faces tell him that they don't know if they're dreaming or if they're dead, or dead from dreaming, or trapped within their corpses. Help them! Just then a giant creature appears and Moon Knight jolts right awake. He gets up, kicking the door down, running into Skeleton's office. Skeleton asks, what is it? But Moon Knight grabs him by the hair, slamming his face into the desk. And as Moon Knight pulls him over the desk, Skeleton yells that his brain is under attack, just like the others. Moon Knight slams him into the ground once more, telling him, shut up! And he drags him back into the room. After being thrown against the wall, Skeleton shouts, asking what is he doing, and Moon Knight kneels down, ripping up the floorboards, telling him to wake up. Beneath the floor lies a body. The rats skitter away, and under all of that is a corpse rotting with fungus growing on it. Skeleton quickly begins to lean forward, stating that that was one of their first test subjects. Off to the books, found him online. Found out too late that he had some kind of fungal infection in his brain that was killing him. He died in the dream state. We couldn't let anyone find out. So we wrapped him up and put him in the floor. Just for now. Just until. Moon Knight tells him to look at him. Down there. In the damp. In the deep. Rank with whatever crap they put in him. His brain sporulated. He's been breathing in his dreams. As the wind blows down the empty street, the white limo pulls up to a man standing on the side of the road. The window whirls down and the man says to get lost. Moon Knight thrusts his sword towards the man's throat, stating that he confiscated this from a man in Egypt who tried to take away someone from him. He's quite upset. He was told that the man still passes shards of his own ribcage when he goes to the bathroom. Now then, they've taken someone from their home and he's not interested in the politics of the crime families. So don't even bother trying to justify it. How many people are holding that person in there? The man eases back to try and get away from the blade, stating, A dozen, maybe more, fifth floor. And Moon Knight says that he would assume that everyone is spread out, and the man says, You're guessing right. Moon Knight tells him, Good. And as Mr. Knight, they're going through the front door. After grabbing his baton, Moon Knight enters the building, and the man asks where the boards covering the place, not giving him a clue that they're closed. Without saying a word, Moon Knight bashes the man's face in and knocks him to the ground. A gunman comes out asking who is he supposed to be, and Moon Knight charges in, throwing a moon blade into the gunman's hand, bashing his face in, telling him, the one you see coming. A third man comes running down the stairs, but Moon Knight swipes at the man's ankle, snapping it, throwing him on his back onto the railing. On the next floor, a bullet whizzes by hitting the baton, but Moon Knight looks at the cracked baton, firing it into the gunman's face, stating, those cost real money, and I don't have a job. As he moves on to the second floor, he whips a Moonblade upward into a man's mouth and kicks him over the edge. At the third floor, a large muscular man steps out and Moon Knight punches. The large man grabs Moon Knight by the face, stating that that ain't going to work. Moon Knight then takes two of his blades and jams them into the man's chest to free himself. And then he takes his jacket, covering the man's head, throwing him over the railings. On the fourth floor, Moon Knight rolls up his sleeves and he proceeds to take out anyone in his path. As he reaches the fifth floor, a well-dressed man steps out with two knives. Moon Knight throws a moon blade, the man deflects it, and Moon Knight looks at him. Impressive. The man swings, but Moon Knight catches his arm, snapping his wrist, and then he takes the other, driving the knife into the man's leg. After throwing him through a door, Moon Knight runs in, sliding on the ground, kicking out the next man's legs, shattering them. 
Another man comes running in with a bat, but as he gets close, Moon Knight hits him in the throat, telling him, I needed one of those. Now using the bat, Moon Knight bashes his way through everyone else and sees a man running for the roof. He ignores him, looking in the room, with a young girl is tied up and a man pointing a gun at her. The gunman says that he's pretty sure that this beats his bat, and Moon Knight tells him, I already love this bat, and you owe me a truncheon, and you can't kill me. But you can kill her, sure. But what saves your life after she's dead? Everyone already thinks the kid is dead. That loss is acceptable. Have they accepted yours? Are you ready to die today? The man lowers the gun, and as Moon Knight takes it from him, he cracks the gunman with the bat. Moon Knight unties the girl, telling her, Hello, Scarlet. I guess I must look pretty weird. My name is Mr. Knight. Scarlet reaches out, touching Moon Knight's face. She says that it's not a mask. It's his face. He laughs. You're a smart kid. He then calls in his glider and begins to give it very specific instructions. Out on the roof, the man from before tries to run and escape and the glider comes crashing down on him, horribly injuring him. But as Moon Knight walks out and kneels beside him, he tells him that they're going to have a chat. He's going to tell his friends, tell them that he met him. And when they see him coming, they run. Several nights ago, when Moon Knight came to investigate the scene of the slasher murder, he met an officer whom he told that he preferred to be the one to go into the sewers. That officer was Ryan Trent. Ryan watched Moon Knight walk away and he asked why would they even let him do this and Flint says not to take it personally. Ryan asks what's so special about this guy, is it because he's better than them? Because they have some weird buddies or something? And Flint told him that he lets Mr. Knight work because he has a crappy attitude and he's going to be a street cop until he dies. Those words, they sunk in. All his life, Ryan was met with hardship always told to follow the rules, get a girlfriend, and nobody respects him. So he decided to become a cop instead of fighting for his country. And he was told that he doesn't even know what he wants, that he's just going through life like a ghost, that he's never going to be good enough for anything or anybody. Does he have to wear a bag over his head to be special, to get respect? The hell with that! He will find out what is so damn special about this Mr. Knight. So Ryan did some digging. There wasn't much on Moon Knight, but there was some information on his known enemies, namely the Black Spectre. So using the idea of the man that Moon Knight took down in the old shield bunker, Ryan got to work. He trained himself to be able to throw darts with extreme precision, because those moon boomerangs are stupid. Using the dead man's identity, Ryan began to question people. First, Marlene Arun. He asked if Moon Knight had anyone that he was close with, and Marlene told him that she hasn't heard from him in years, only read about him in the papers. Next was Jean-Paul Jachamp. Ryan flashed the shield, stating that he had a few questions. Did Moon Knight work with anyone? And Jean-Paul says that he works with a drone and a self-driving car. He doesn't work with anyone. And that is because the people around him do not survive. But there is one more thing that they should know, that he will never stop. Moon Knight will go on and on, using people, spending his bottomless pit of blood money, and he cannot die. And now Ryan has the information that he needs. He could become the Black Spectre. He was the opposite of Moon Knight, and once he kills him, he can replace him. Just imagine what Flint would think then when he reveals his own face as the one under that mask. He won't ever disrespect him again. Ryan's wife asks if he's going to murder Moon Knight and replace him. Ryan tells her that that's exactly what he's going to do. But there's one more thing about Moon Knight. He works alone, no ties. He's technically dead, and so is she. After killing his own wife, Ryan gears up and goes out into the night as the Black Spectre. Moon Knight gets a call of a murder and goes to investigate, but the murder was caused by Ryan, and he booby-trapped the body. As Moon Knight's limo pulls up to the car, Ryan detonates the bomb, blowing up the limo, and even himself away. Ryan walks out into the street, asking if he did it. Where are Moon Knight's special powers now? Where did all that moon crap and arrogance go? Ryan then looks to see Moon Knight flying in on his glider, but as he gets closer, Ryan shoots it down. Moon Knight jumps off onto the nearby building, and as he grabs a moon blade, Ryan throws a dart into his arm. Ryan tells him that this isn't going to be a fight. He is going to kill him because he is better than him. And everyone is going to love him more than they've ever loved Moon Knight. Just then, Ryan's second explosion goes off and with him next to it. He's violently blown away, skipping across the street, and Moon Knight asks, Who the hell are you supposed to be? And he weakly tells him, The Black Spectre. Moon Knight leans down, ripping his mask off, telling him that he's going to tell him about the Black Spectre. 
He really just wanted to be loved. He wanted his dad and his wife to love him. He wanted his crew to love him. And I don't know you. Now me, people who love me suffer and die. And I never want to be loved. Moon Knight pulls the dart out of his eye, tossing it, telling him. And that's why Moon Knight always wins. As the rain pours down on New York City, an assassin with advanced tech tells his camo suit to change the presets. Nighttime. Rainfall. The suit begins to blend in with the surroundings and the assassin begins to run through the streets to get into position. But as he moves, the suit begins to play the newsfeed of the arrival of General Alamon Lore that is arriving from the war-torn African nation of Akima to speak before the United Nation. Many people suspect lore of a war crimes during Akima's war for independence, though it has not been confirmed firsthand. The assassin's suit then brings up its targeting interface and locates lore in his convoy. The assassin takes a deep breath to steady his aim. Once locked on, he pulls the trigger, but something hits him from behind, causing the shot to hit low. Mr. Knight picks the man up asking, who are you? The assassin opens up an interface on his palm, and after a few presses, the suit emits an electrical shock that knocks Mr. Knight away. The man quickly gets back up, firing his sidearm, but by the time he runs out of bullets, he sees Laura running away. The assassin begins typing away at the suit's interface again, and Mr. Knight asks, what are you doing in my city? But before he could get an answer, the assassin activates an EMP wide enough to knock out the power to the entire city. The assassin begins to run in the direction of Lore, and Moon Knight sighs as he straightens his tie, asking, Am I going to have to run? He catches up, throwing the assassin into a nearby window, and the assassin asks, What the devil are you? Moon Knight tells him, I am the one hunting the devil. You have no business being here, now what are you doing? The assassin tells him that he is on a mission under the highest authority. Mr. Knight asks, what do you mean, God? The assassin tells him, higher. Try honor, dignity, freedom. And after receiving a few blows, Mr. Knight leans forward asking, how about something with a badge? The assassin shouts to get out of his way, but Moon Knight tackles him to the ground, telling him, you are endangering the lives of people. They are my authority. The assassin opens the interface on his palm, but Mr. Knight grips the man by the wrist, telling him, no more tricks. You're a soldier, but an EMP weapon capable of taking out New York City isn't exactly standard issue. Talk! The assassin rolls back, kicking Mr. Knight off, taking off once again. So Mr. Knight chases him through the blacked out city and onto a building. As he climbs up, he stares down at the barrel of the assassin's rifle. And Mr. Knight calmly climbs up, telling him, You won't shoot. You're a soldier. Whatever it is that is driving you, you used words like honor and dignity. Blacking out a city to slow a target, sure, but shooting an unarmed man? Not a part of the military code of conduct. Your act of duty, I assume. The assassin asks, who are you? So Mr. Knight fixes his jacket. I am protecting the night travelers, like General Aliman Lore, a guest of the city. The assassin goes on telling him that he is a part of the advanced recon team deployed to the Akima Badlands to support the UN peacekeepers. He saw firsthand what sort of man Aliman Lore is. He promised the victims that Lore would pay. Crime against his own people, women and children. Refugees, this is bigger than you, freak show, now stand down. The assassin takes off, jumping over to the next building, but Mr. Knight follows, calling in his glider. The assassin lines up his shot, but before pulling his trigger, Mr. Knight knees him in the back of the head. The assassin groans, ah, I made a promise, but then his cell phone begins to ring. Mr. Knight reaches down, answering it, and the voice on the other end asks if it is done. Is the general dead? Can my family rest in peace? Mr. Knight pauses for a moment and says, This is Mr. Knight. The voice pauses. Mr. Knight. Mr. Knight tells the person, Mr. Spectre to you. But I didn't expect to hear the voice of my own doctor. The next night, reports of a hostage situation spreads throughout the news outlets that a man has barricaded himself in the One World Trade Center and is making demands. Moon Knight quietly scales the side of the building, deploying his scarab drones, telling himself that these are working beautifully. Perhaps the best invention to date. He then calls Detective Flint, stating that he is nearly there, and Flint says that the office in question takes up nearly a fifth of the floor, Mr. Knight, directly opposite your current position. Moon Knight tells him that Mr. Knight has taken the night off. Call me Grant. Flint tells him, okay, well, Mr. Grant, we can only hold the feds back for so long, sneak in and get some answers, the whole world is watching. So while Grant does just that, the terrorist inside records one of the hostages telling him to say it. Say it, and maybe he'll see his family again. One, two... Three. The hostage begins to state that this message is for the paymasters and puppet string holders of immoral and corrupt government industrial complexes. Please listen carefully to the following. X-Ray, Beta Kilo, Juliet 552. 
As the man goes on, Flynn says that he'll just get someone to decode it ASAP. But that video is showing up on dozens of video share sites. Their time is running out. As the hostage finishes, the terrorist tells him to describe what he is wearing. And the hostage hesitates for a second, then begins to describe what the terrorist is wearing, stating that it is a bomb vest like a suicide bomber. Lots of wires, blocks of explosive material, and a tank, like a scuba tank. The terrorist spins the camera to face him and holds the tank up, stating that that is not a scuba tank. Look at it. Confirm the numbers, and then you'll realize. In the meantime, if you come in here, I will salt the earth. Once closer to the terrace, Grant quickly moves through cubicle to cubicle until he reaches his destination. Then he tells himself, Lockley, you're good to go. Complete recon. Find angles. Pick your plan of attack. Lockley sighs, stating, yeah, yeah, I'm on it. I see the trigger. Simple wiring, left arm, possible neural switch. No signs of secondary trigger. Lockley rushes in, punching the terrorist, and then grabs his left arm, twisting and snapping it. After dislocating the shoulder, the man falls to the ground and begins to reach with his right arm. So Lockley steps on it, asking, isn't one dead arm enough? He then kneels down and begins to work, telling the terrorist that he's never had a chance. He was dead the minute he came up with this idea. Now give me your hand. No, the trigger hand. Here's something to remember me by. After carving out the trigger, Lockley stands up, telling the man to hand over the rifle. Now, and you're welcome, all of you. As Lockley begins to head down, Flint calls back, asking for Grant. And Lockley tells him that it's Lockley, for now. Turn back on the elevators and have everyone ready for the handoff. Flint says, okay, well, Lockley I spoke with, but Moon Knight stops him. No, it's Mr. Knight now. And Flint says, fine, whatever. I called your doctor. She said that you are diagnosed with disassociative identity disorder and that you are a violent danger to both yourself and others. She said that you've been avoiding her professional cases. Perhaps police intervention is necessary at this point. Sorry, but you will be surrendering as well, Moon Knight. It's time for you to go to your doctor. But as the doors to the elevator open up, the police find that Moon Knight is already gone. Back at home, Khonshu says that he stepped in at this time, son. And Moon Knight says that he was set up, betrayed. Khonshu says... What he perceives as damage already done is just the start of it. The next day, Moon Knight sits on the couch, stating that she can relax. Even though she tried to kill him twice, he isn't going to take it personally. Though, she may have something to tell him. Probably the sort of thing that's difficult to verbalize. She is clearly under tremendous pressure. Others may be influencing her. He can help her with that. The doctor said that she is glad that he finally came to his session. Shall I begin with the hypnosis? Where would he like to start? Soon, everything changes to Knight's dreamscape, and the two are now atop of the Sphinx. The doctor says that that is... interesting. Is this place comforting? Knight, now wearing the Khonshu armor, tells her, Very much so. The doctor examines the armor, asking if this is Khonshu's persona. Tell her about it. And Knight explains that Khonshu is the Egyptian moon deity. It saved his life, and he carried it with him ever since. He was in cardiac arrest when Khonshu rescued him, but she already knew that. She's done her research. She tells him that she is his doctor, but Knight says that she clearly is more than just his doctor and he wants to know who or what she is. Doctor says that she has no secrets, and Knight removes his helmet stating that it's easy to say when she's the one controlling the session. Care to let him take the wheel? The scene shifts to East Africa, while dozens of soldiers march through Akima. The doctor stares at one of the men stating that Lore was much younger here. He really should have let her kill him. See the blood on his face? She remembers this night. They were returning from a raid on a nearby village her village. And there was no raid. It was a massacre, and she's the only one who survived. Well played. You have done your homework as well, Knight. She was out fetching water just before dark when on her way home, Laura and his militia drove by. Laura looked at her and said that when they're done, they'll be back for her. Akima ended its fighting years ago. It's disarmed, building schools and it joined the international community, and it's due to be recognized by the UN next month. If she wanted to hold General Lore accountable, there are ways to do that. There are agencies who do this sort of thing, expose his crime for the world to see. There's no need for street justice here, to only build on his legend by killing him. The doctor tells her, no, you have to see. So the scene changes again to the doctor's burning village, and she says that this isn't the only place that this happened. Syria, the Tribor area, Crimea, Mexican-US border. There are General Lores everywhere, Knight. Right now, you have a chance to stop them. Lore is the one who pulls the trigger and kills her mother and sister. Do it! Kill him now! So the world shifts back to Egypt, and Knight tells her no. She's trying to recruit him like the assassin. She can't deal with her past by murdering people in the present. The doctor scoffs. Your hypocrisy is incredible! But Knight says what he does has nothing to do with this. Lore isn't running death squads now. He can protect people, but Lore put away his machete decades ago. 
This is a dream of a distant past. None of this is real and she can't recruit him. The doctor says that she knows. He is not the one that she is recruiting and suddenly they are in Conchu's tomb. She goes on stating that he lost the moment he even decided to pay her a visit. Such an arrogant man. Knight falls to his knees. You can't do this. Conchu is me and I am Conchu. The doctor asks, is he sure? Why don't you show me that armor again? But as Knight tries to materialize it, he looks up to see the doctor is now wearing it. She tells him that it would seem that Conchu has made a change, that Conchu is going with the winner now, not some damaged man who can't decide whether or not to save a little girl from a murderous warlord. Knight says that this isn't happening and he tries to grasp on, but the floor beneath him breaks away and a few moments later he wakes up on the couch alone. He touches his face to feel his facial hair has grown quite a bit and asks how long is he out. He gets up opening the doctor's laptop to see a list of names, a hit list. Domestic terrorists, international terrorists, corrupt heads of state. It's all pretty sloppy, but leaving this here? Just then a countdown appears on the screen, counting down from five, and that's when Knight notices the bomb. He begins to run out asking Khonshu to come, but Khonshu isn't there, no one is there, and as it reaches zero, the room explodes. It was another day for Officer Gloria Rosa, as she puts on her police uniform and gets ready to go to work as the security at the UN building. When she reaches her locker, she hears a voice calling to her, that in 36 hours, she will die. She pulls a gun asking who's there. Are they trying to prank her? Come on, joke's over. As she looks around the locker room, the doctor appears behind her, telling her that she has 36 hours. She will work her shift like normal, say nothing. She will be contacted later. When Gloria turns back, she sees nothing. The next day, things go as normal. Nothing out of the ordinary. And as Gloria returns to her apartment, the doctor tells her that she did well. She kept their secret from her superiors and co-workers. Smart. She begins to head towards the bathroom, and the doctor asks where is she going. To retrieve the pistol hidden underneath her tank, the 38 Detective Special, your father's old service weapon, correct? There are no secrets here. So let us talk about a story. A story about a hero. That hero is you. Gloria Rosa, America's newest hero. Who would say how many lives you've saved? How many murders you've prevented? And all it takes is one bullet, one target, and all you have to do is kill one man. Gloria says she took an oath. She took this job to protect people. And the doctor tells her, What do you know of General Alamon Lore? Did you know that he was a murderer? That he even killed your family? Gloria begins to see the horrors of lore, and she screams for it to stop. And the doctor tells her that she lived through that every day for 30 years. I too begged God to make it stop, but there is no God to help you, Gloria. How does it feel to know that you would give your life in defense of the indefensible? The UN houses sociopaths who carry diplomatic passports and walk freely and are taken as equals by their peers, many of which are brutalizing their own people. If a single person in that building had a spine, these amoral men and women would be denied any participation in the World Committee. They would be ostracized, hunted down like common thugs, and dealt with. A point of view your father would agree with, wouldn't he, Gloria? He was a police officer in Venezuela, right? Highly decorated, very respected, a man who viewed his job first and foremost as a matter of justice. The law was a secondary consideration. Gloria says that it cost him his life. She was 12 when he was murdered. The doctor asks what better way to honor him. You keep his service weapon close by. He is your role model. Next, you will go about your day, the same as always, and you will make a positive ID. Then, you will draw your weapon, and you will fire. The next day, Gloria goes to work. It is briefed by General Lore entering the building. He and his team will be coming through the service entrance using a catering service as a disguise. In addition to the servicemen here, Washington sent them another set of eyes, and her name was Agent Kenrick with the FBI. The doctor stands up, and as the FBI agent, tells everyone that she will be here strictly as an intelligence support. She is familiar with the general's enemies and will be monitoring the crowd outside for any threats that may emerge. God forbid, of course. Gloria goes on her security detail. She watches as Laura and his team begin to enter the building, and she reaches for her gun. And then a man from the crowd jumps over the railing, tackling Laura. Everyone stares at the dirty, bloody man, and they realize that that man is Mark Spector, Mr. Knight. Knight tells her that she doesn't want to do this, and soon the officers come, and they begin to escort Mr. Knight away, telling Gloria that she is no longer needed. They have it under control. So later, 
After being taken to an unknown facility, the officers tell Mr. Knight that his face is now all over the media. The Tower Vigilante. And then there's a crack as the butt of one of the officer's guns hits Knight in the face. And all the officers join in, beating Moon Knight. As he wakes up, he goes through the same routine. He's escorted around by people with masks. He takes his medication. He walks in a circle with the other prisoners, takes more medication. He's injected with something and he goes to sleep. This is the cost for a schizophrenic individual trying to attack a diplomatic immune individual. So every so often a doctor comes in to check on him and ask how is he doing. And every time, Knight says that he has been detained illegally. His Mirandan rights were not read to him. His requests for a lawyer have been ignored. He has medical procedures done to him without his consent. The doctor writes in his clipboard stating that he can easily answer the questions, but they need something first. Obedience, acceptance, compliance. And only then will they begin to move forward. Knight asks, what am I not doing already? And the doctor tells him, no, you are being submissive while it's taken from you. It is not the same. You will have to be willing. We will pick up with your sessions tomorrow. Have a good day. So the next day, while being escorted, Knight begins to touch things, feel the walls, feel the floor. It's all cold. And as he goes to bed, Kanchu tells him that that is impressive. You've been locked away for how long? The walls are cold. At this rate, you'll be here forever. Knight scoffs. That's what I want. I saw a better prospect and I took it. I went with the better option, the better Moon Knight. The next day, Knight continues his routine, but another prisoner in the circle grabs and shanks him. He doesn't fight back. He just gives in. He allows it. And while getting stitched up, Conchu tells him, Most people would fight back. What happened to the man I used to know? Are you giving up already? Knight tells him that he shouldn't have linked with the doctor. She's using him. The Akima War was decades ago. She could have moved against Lore when he was less protected, less public. Why is she acting now? Why did she need Conchu? Conchu states, Your methods were not normal either. As the nurse finishes up and reports the patient is stable, Knight reaches back, punching her. Taking her badge, Knight tells Conchu that the doctor is wrong. Look at it. You may be a god, but you need to vet your candidates a little better. Knight runs to escape, using the nurse's keycard to move forward, but when the biometric scan shows a mismatch, he starts to look around. He touches the cold walls, looking for something, and then he finds the seam. Using a scalpel, he pries open the seam and he begins to hear a hiss. He crawls through it and a warning can be heard that there is a security breach. Recommendation, evacuation of double hull. Knight begins to hear the sound of machinery moving and then a light shines on his face. He is in fact in the cargo space of a plane. He tries to hang on, but the pressure sucks him out and he begins to plummet back to earth. As he begins to pass out, he can hear Conchu telling him, Fine, you've bought yourself some time. Knight asks him how, and Conchu's armor begins to wrap around Mark Spector. Conchu asks, do you want to survive? Knight tells him no. And as Knight hits the water below, Conchu tells him, the clock starts now. Work fast. A short while later, a fishing boat sails by and a man pokes Knight with a stick. He gasps, grabbing a hold of it, and the man asks, what is he doing? What does he need? Knight tells him, I need a phone. Back in New York, a journalist hears her phone ring, and she answers it asking, who is it? Knight tells her, this is Mark Spector. Would you like to know how the story ends? Help me out, and the exclusive is yours. Elsewhere, Lore begins to wake up from being knocked out, and he hears Conchu's voice telling him that he is dead. His life ends here. Make it easy on yourself. Tell me what I want to know. Tell me! Lore screams, and one of the guards radios back to the doctor, telling her that she needs to come in. She says that she'll be there soon. Shut Lore up. The guard asks if everything's okay. They're way off schedule. This op was supposed to be a few hours, not a few days. The doctor tells him to just shut Lore up. She is on her way. And Conchu tells her, you are losing it. The doctor asks him not to go, but Conchu states that Spectre had a point. The doctor says that Mark Spectre was weak. She is strong. Don't go. She is strong, Conchu. A few moments later, as the doctor enters, the guards leave telling her to have their money in the Cayman Islands within the hour. They were never here. Don't contact them again. Laura looks up, stating that it's gone, isn't it? The demon. The Papa Bawa. All he sees is the poor little horn of the African girl again. The doctor yells that she has no such thing, and Laura goes on. You are Elisa Warsame. You were never poor, were you? 
This fiction you spin of a child brutalized in the bush. You were the governor's daughter. Your father was Adrian Warsam, installed in 1968 by the Danish colonial warlords. So it is the likes of you who brutalize them. Elisa says to tell her what she wants to know, and Laura yells, You are over! Colonial rape of East Africa is over! Your control over me is over! No, I will not tell you what you want to know. What you want belongs to me and the people of Akima. Your family amassed hundreds of millions of looted golden treasures. Adrian sold Akima's mineral rights and pocketed all the money. For 40 years as an unelected governor, he bled our country into poverty, into war, and eventually genocide. I took back Akima! Elisa asks where is the money and Laura laughs. You won't even get 10 foot into Akima without being killed by a loyal son or daughter. Your face is no, your name is poison. You will never get that money! Elisa stands up pointing her gun at Lore, and he says, It's a hell of a thing, isn't it? To be the one pulling the trigger. You always had your cordon of security, didn't you? Your private little army. Go ahead, shoot! You will never win. There are many stronger than you. The time of your father and you is over. This is a new century. Shoot! Hell, I deserve it. Elisa bashes the side of the gun into his face, shouting, Give me my money! Give it to me! It belongs to me! As Elisa begins to choke Lore, a Moonblade hits her in the hand. She looks up at Moon Knight, stating, This was justice! They took everything! Moon Knight kneels down. That is not justice. That's privilege, complacency, and domination. It breeds hatred, violence, war. Both of you represent a system that belongs to the past. My fellow travelers of the night will never fear either of you again. Later that night, the reporter heads home for the evening when someone bumps into her. She reaches into her pocket to see if anything was taken, but instead, she pulls out a large rolled stack of cash and a note that reads, Thank you, Mr. Spectre. As the halls of Mark Spectre's rundown hotel building is filled with wandering ghosts, he calls out to them asking what do they want. Don't they know that this is private property? This isn't some place that you can stay anymore. It hasn't been for a while. This is his home now go find somewhere else to be. But as Spectre turns back to his room, he sees it filled with even more ghosts. He sighs, stating, great. But then Khonshu tells him to not turn his back on these wayward souls. He is their priest, and this is his congregation. All of the ghosts reach out to Spectre, but as they do, they all begin to fade away. Spectre looks back at Khonshu, telling him that he knows how he feels about ghosts. Khonshu tells him that the shepherd needs not love every member of his flock. But it remains the shepherd's duty to protect them, one and all. Now let the souls guide you. Follow the trail. Mark Spector is confused as to what trail this could mean. And then he sees the bloody footprints. Meanwhile, at another location, the Apex Wholesale's meatpacking facility. A couple of men are discussing what they're doing. They're explaining that they've got a gold mine here. That they can make the dead dance like puppets. That with this machine, they can track residual mortality energy and draw ghosts here like flies. At that moment, Moon Knight strikes on two of the station guards. As one yells that this ghost packs a punch! Moon Knight cracks another with his baton, and a third tackles him into a rack of hanging meat. Moon Knight then rolls it back with a throw, tossing several moon blades, hitting the men and the swinging carcass. The leader of the group asks what's going on, and the text says that the readings are strange, some sort of backlash. He's never seen a violent reaction like this before, but the gloves should still work. As Moon Knight finishes, with blood splattered all over the place, he asks, Why ghosts? The leader says that if you put a price tag on something, brand it in the right way, people will buy it. They could be trophies, companions, conversation pieces, even weapons. The leader then swings, and as he puts his hand out, Moon Knight asks, Was something supposed to happen? Are you trying to catch me? Do you think that I'm just another ghost? Moon Knight breaks the glove, telling him, I am no ghost! And he steps back, slipping on one of the witch's orbs. The leader jumps on him, telling him, Well, if you aren't one, you will be soon enough. As the two begin to struggle, Moon Knight grabs one of the orbs, slamming it into the man's mouth and lets it activate. He falls back, he gags, he begins to vomit, and as he does, Moon Knight kicks him. He turns to the tech, asking, I ask again, why ghosts? The tech slams his laptop, telling him that he doesn't mess with ghosts anymore. He's all done with that. And Moon Knight tells him, Smart answer. But I'm not done with you. One of these days I will find you and I will ask for a favor, and when the time comes, you'll be falling over yourself to deliver. The tech grabs the computer, demanding to know how Moon Knight even found them. They were careful, they moved from place to place. And Moon Knight tells him, Simple, I followed the footprints. 
The tech begins to look around, not seeing any footprints. And Moon Knight takes out an orb, telling him, I'm going to set the spirits free. And my guess is that they're none too pleased with the people who trapped them. My suggestion? Run. The tech flees, and all of the ghosts return, reaching out as if to thank Moon Knight. And he tells them, they are free now. They can go on with their business, whatever the hell it is. And Moon Knight begins to leave, but as the silent ghosts watch, they see a trail of footprints, and they begin to follow. On another Moon Knight adventure, the light flickers in the morgue, and Detective Flint says that they can see the headline now, Werewolves by Night. Moon Knight examines one of the bodies, stating that if that's the case, it's a good thing that they contacted him, because he knows a thing or two about werewolves. Flint says, right, that kind of weird is the reason we asked you to come here. At risk of my badge, again, I need to consult you on this. Moon Knight finishes up stating that his secret is safe with him and Flint Scott's. The haircut alone is probably worth more than my suit. And Moon Knight says that it would seem that the only thing the victims have in common is money. Later at a high-end restaurant, the dinner room is packed while the cooks in the back quickly work to get more food out on time. One of the servers goes to take a trash bag out and a dog charges in biting him. Soon the entire kitchen is filled with rabid dogs, and just as the customers begin to hear something in the back, the dogs make their way into the dining room. Everyone stares for a moment, asking what is even going on, but the dogs snarl. They charge in, they lunge at one of the guests. But before the dog could bite, Moon Knight jumps in, kicking the dog back to the pack. Everyone looks at Moon Knight, and he looks back up. Boo! Everyone screams, running for the exit, and the dogs begin to growl with Moon Knight throwing more of his moon blades at them, but the ones that he missed quickly run in and begin to start biting. He tries to fight them off, but the sheer number of dogs begin to overwhelm Moon Knight, and they begin to rip his armor with every pull. Moon Knight manages to kick one of them that's biting his arm, and then he throws a smoke bomb, scaring them all off. At that moment, he pulls up a GPS tracker, telling them, Good. Run. Tell me where you're heading, you dumb mutts. Can't you see that I'm trying to help you? Later, in the auto salvage yard, Moon Knight walks through when he feels something wet on his leg. He reaches down, touching the blood from the bites earlier, and scoffs that they've ruined another damn suit. As he walks, he hears barking off in the distance, and he sees a dog laying on the ground. And as he gets closer, he notices the dog isn't actually breathing, and that the tracker that he threw is stabbed into the dog's eye. He looks at the blade. This didn't kill you, did it? No, someone else did. Because you failed, and this was punishment. Sorry about that, but I'll make it up to you. He heads over to one of the buildings in the lot and sees inside are all the dogs from the four, but all locked up in cages. He looks around to find some rather expensive shoes on the table. He then turns to the dogs as they whine, stating, You've seen better days too, huh? So a short while later, the owner of the salvage yard returns, walking in asking why aren't they barking? Did they learn their lesson? Good, because he has a damn headache. At that moment, Moon Knight grabs him, throwing him across the room, and the man asks what is going on. Moon Knight tells him that he has to ask, what is it that they were hoping to accomplish? Training dogs to track expensive clothing to target the wealthy, beating them, teaching them to be vicious? The man yells, asking, what makes those rich scum so special? What makes them so much better than us? Gonna knock them off their high horse. And Moon Knight says, it's not your job to teach them. They might fall, or they don't, as fate dictates. You're one of them, aren't you? A rich guy protecting your rich friends. Moon Knight laughs. laughs. Wrong on both counts. I'm not one of them, and I'm not protecting them. I simply protect the travelers at night. I am their shepherd. This is my flock, and every dog has his day. As Moon Knight points, the dogs all begin to attack the owner, ripping at his skin as he screams for help. And Moon Knight takes his leave, stating that Khonshu protects them, and bids that they tell their master that they're even. In a dark alleyway, Moon Knight falls to the ground, bleeding, asking, Why? Why can't you? Why have you forsaken me? He replays the scene in his mind. The creature, the claws, the throws, the blood. But as Moon Knight looks up, he sees a group of people walking towards him. They begin to pick him up, and he tries to ask what are they doing. But in his weakened state, he passes out. A few days later, Mark Spector wakes up in his bed in a panic, and a man tells him to take it easy. He's been out for a while. It's normal to be disoriented. Spectre says that he's new here, and he isn't like the others. They're real, not ghosts. Who are they? The man tells him that they're friends. They found him and brought him in. So Spectre asks, how did they know about this place? Actually, forget I asked. Just do me a favor and give me a few minutes alone. The man leaves, telling him okay, just yell if he needs something. And as the door shuts, Mark Spectre waits for a moment, telling them, okay, we're alone. 
Are you gonna ask the question? Kanchu tells him, I have not forsaken you. You are still my son. And Spectre laughs. You could have fooled me. Where were you when I was getting my guts ripped out? Or do you want to make me look like one of those mummies? Kanchu tells him, you chose to venture out on your own. You fought without my blessing. This was not our fight. Do I need your permission every time I go out? This thing, this creature, it's terrorizing people, hurting children. Kanchu tells him that they raised him from the dead. Time and time again, they have offered guidance and aid. And only three nights ago, as he lay bleeding in the street, they brought him sucker by guiding the healers to his side. But if he defies them again, we cannot help. Spectre gets up from his bed asking, can't or won't? Kanchu transforms shouting, you doubt me! Spectre tells him, I know you, Kanchu, god of the moon and of travelers. You're wrong. You're wrong for not helping me. I don't need you. Mark Spectre then leaves the room, making his way to the armory. But as he looks at the wall of guns, he smiles. Later, beneath a young child's bed, the creature crawls out, telling the little girl that it's okay to be scared. All the others were afraid, too. When I came for them, it made them taste so much better. The grotesque creature looms over the girl, opening its maw, stating, If it's any constellation, I'm sorry that it has to be this way, but I can't help myself. Not when the hunger is so... Hmm? The creature hears a sound, and then the room is suddenly filled with bullets from automatic rifles. The creature falls in a bloody mess, and Moon Knight climbs in, telling him, It's okay. Not a scratch on me. After all this time, I'm still a pretty good shot. The little girl looks down at all the guns and bullets strapped to Moon Knight, asking, Are you another boogeyman? And Moon Knight tells him, That's right. And when you see a boogeyman, you run. Get your parents. Get out of here. Don't come back until the morning. At that moment, the creature lunges at Moon Knight. He gracefully leaves behind, unloading more bullets into the creature's back. But before landing, the creature swings its massive arm, barely clipping Moon Knight, sending him into a wall. And then grabs him by the leg, but Moon Knight takes out another pair of guns and unloads them as well. The creature falls on its face, trying to crawl back under the bed. No! Not like this! Get away! Moon Knight steps on him. No. I'm not going anywhere. And he fires his pistols point blank into the creature's skull. After taking a deep breath, he sits down and begins to remove his gear, asking... I hope you were watching. Your servant gets along fine without your help, Khonshu. Amen. But as Moon Knight gets ready to leave, he hears the creature speak. But he can't quite make out the words. Moon Knight kneels down, telling the creature to spit it out. Come on! And the creature looks up at Moon Knight, asking, Why, Khonshu? Why have you forsaken me? With the streets busy and everyone going about their night, several people just disappear as a gust of wind suddenly passes by. People begin to look around, and when they look up, they see a group of people with jetpacks carrying unsuspecting people as their leader tells them, All right, let's take the payload to the nest. One of the people begin to panic, and the kidnapper tells them to stop squirming, be still, or he'll slam them into one of the buildings. But suddenly, one of the kidnapper's wings are shot, and he asks, What? What hit me? Everyone stops to look around, but then a blinding light shines upon them, and the leader tells everyone to scramble, We're under attack! As the light fades, the leader points off, stating, There he is, and Moon Knight begins to fly in with his moon glider. The leader yells for everyone to drop back and flank him, to drop the payload. As the kidnappers release the hostages, Moon Knight tells his computer to send out drones and retrieve the falling targets. Three mini moon drones shoot out, flying towards the hostages, but before they can hit the ground, they catch them, landing them safely on the street. The kidnappers then turn their attention to Moon Knight, firing everything that they've got. Then Moon Knight tells the computer to deploy countermeasures. Chafe. Just then the glider releases hundreds of moon blades back towards the kidnappers, tearing into one of them and causing him to crash. The kidnappers, though, don't let up as they continue to fire on Moon Knight, and he tells the computer to deploy the missile swarm. Dozens of shutters begin to open up on tops of gliders, firing miniature missiles, releasing smoke in the air to allow him to escape. The kidnappers stop and look around, asking where could he have gone, and the leader notices the reflection in the building. He calls out that they're above, and Moon Knight tells the computer to release drones 2 and 3, predator mode, suicide run. The two drones shoot out towards the other two kidnappers, and when they hit, they explode, leaving only the leader alive. 
As the leader begins to escape, and as Moon Knight follows, his glider begins to burn out from the damage that it has taken earlier. As the glider crashes into a nearby building, Moon Knight tells the computer to send it Drone 4 to his location. He uses the drone to follow the leader to an offshore oil refinery, and he quietly sneaks in. He finds a group of people chained to the floor and a winded man chained to the wall. Moon Knight says that he's going to help them, but one of the men on the ground asks, Is it you? Are you the one who will kill them? When the flying men took us, they said the raptor goddess would come for them, that they were taking us to its nest so that its children could feed the mother for a change. Moon Knight begins to unshackle the people, telling them that they're safe now. But the man asks, how can you be so sure? Do you know the raptor goddess? Moon Knight looks up at the dead being strung up on the wall. I know the type, but the raptor isn't coming for you. She flew too close to the moon, and the moon must also be fed. Just then the leader yells, you're lying! Why would you do that? You're supposed to be our friend. The goddess said that you were her servant too, and that we wouldn't need to fear you. Promises were made. She'll come for us. And if she's pleased with our offerings, she'll guide us and make us angels, real angels. As the man opens fire, he shoots the chained figure on the wall and then runs up asking, What? The idol! I didn't mean to! I didn't want to! Moon Knight knocks the man out, telling him, Don't worry. You can't kill a god so easily. If you could, everyone would be doing that. But you can't get faith and desperation mixed up. Do that and you're only sacrificing yourself. As the people that were chained up stand, they ask what do they do now, and Moon Knight tells them to follow him. Once outside, one of the women stops him, asking if he's an angel, but Moon Knight tells her, no, he's like them, the ones who brought them here. They weren't angels, and neither was he. An angel doesn't need to scream for his god to take note. As the homeless begin to line up outside of a newly opened shelter, the workers smile, telling everyone to come in, come in. They have room for everyone. Everything is going to be all right now. While the homeless smile back and head inside, one man doesn't. And the man at the door tells him that it looks like he's having a hard time out there. Don't worry, though. They're going to get him back on his feet. Once inside, the people are split into groups, and one person walks up to an elderly man, telling him, Hey, hi, welcome. Why don't we show you around a bit? We're going to get you back on your feet. This place is a place of healing. We'll all help each other here. Everyone pulls their own weight in one way or another. The old man sees one of the workers handing out pieces of cardboard with phrases asking for money, telling them that they will each be assigned a location to panhandle. Of course, all money collected is then brought back to the facility to be distributed. They will then have a daily quota that needs to be met. They have room for everyone, and everyone pulls their weight here. So the old man follows the guide, stating, Hey, those signs, they were uh, handwritten on cardboard. But they were all bent up and folded the same way, like they were mass-produced. The guide smiles. Oh, no one else has ever noticed that before. But don't worry about it. Everything is going to be all right now. Being with us, you are a part of something bigger. Our savior has blessed us all. All of the night's travelers. But you all have duties to fulfill. Some of us, like myself, have been chosen to be a part of the welcoming community. Others have been selected to bring in tithes either through begging or through more aggressive means. Of course, all money collected is brought back to the facility for distribution. We have a quota that needs to be met each day. Everyone pulls their own weight and our savior will bless you all. What about me? What am I supposed to do? Squeegee car windows for spare change? The guide opens a door telling him, not at all. We have something more important to you. To conch you, sacrifices must be made. The old man looks at several bodies scattered about. All dead with men standing there with swords. And the old man looks at them. Uh, I think I've seen enough. The guide smiles. Don't worry. Everything is going to be all right now. We make this as painless as possible. But then the old man reaches into his coat, throwing several moon blades. That's great. Wish I could say the same. The old man takes his baton and with one swing, bashes the faces of the two guards while breaking the arm in the face of the third. The guide steps back. What? What is happening? What is happening? Our savior, please protect us. The old man throws his coat and fake beard to the ground. Your prayers are falling on deaf ears. Khonshu is not listening. As Moon Knight puts on his mask, he holds the baton to the guide's throat, telling him, You've been a good guide so far, so tell me, where do I find the person in charge of this blasphemy? The guide begins to cough as his throat is crushed, telling him, It's not blasphemy! It's the truth! You'll see! Moon Knight looks back to see the other worker standing there, and one says, Welcome. Welcome, Baba. We've been expecting you. Moon Knight stares. You... 
have? And another tells them, of course, you are one of us. Come, your sister is waiting for you. Moon Knight looks up at the statue of Khonshu, telling him, the truth, huh? It better not be. One of the women tells him not to worry. Everything will be all right now. As the guides lead Moon Knight to a doorway, they open it up, telling him, Please, she is waiting inside for you. She has been waiting for a long time. Moon Knight walks into the door, and after the guides shut it, he fixes his tie and collar and walks in. In the next room, a Khonshu priestess sits atop a bloated creature, stating, At last, there you are. Don't you look dapper. Come forward and let me look upon you. Let me get a good look at my brother and my husband. Moon Knight snaps, Husband, that must have been some night in Vegas because I don't remember ever exchanging vows. You swore yourself to me, just as I swore myself to you when we pledged ourselves to Khonshu. Moon Knight scoffs, <laughs> That's funny. Do you condemn all your husbands to human sacrifice? And the priestess looks at him, I didn't even recognize you. You disguised yourself. Only when you revealed yourself were we aware of our union. It is as Khonshu commands. The priestess reaches out, and Moon Knight knocks her hand away, telling her, Whatever you're doing here, sacrificing people, hurting people, this isn't Kanchu's way. <laughs> Surely you can't be so fresh in your vestments to believe that. Kanchu is more than one thing. His whims change like the phases of the moon. One moment the protector of knights travels, the next the hunter. Moon Knight waves his hands. I'm not buying it! You sound like someone who stumbled onto Kanchu's name in a college mythology text, then figured out a way to twist it to serve your own needs. You're using people, making them serve you because you like the attention, making them steal for you because you like money, making them die for you because you have some sort of twisted fetish. The priestess asks, And how do you see Kanchu's glory in these creatures? They are God's gift called from the heavens. Moon Knight then raises his baton. If I'm wrong... Kanchi will try and stay my hand. He'll try, but either way, this ends. The priestess pulls her claws from the creature's flesh. It is a pity. Kanchu must weep to see how far his child has fallen. Perhaps you will find forgiveness in the hereafter. She leaps from the creature's back, slashing her claws, narrowly missing Moon Knight, but cutting his baton into pieces. She grabs his arm, slicing into his side, but as Moon Knight steps back, he begins to feel dizzy, asking, Was that some sort of poison? One of the creatures lashes out, tearing into his back, but the priestess yells that she is Khonshu and she hungers. His flesh will be repurposed for her glory. And Moon Knight says, I know that I doubted you, but this isn't you. I know it isn't Khonshu, and if it's not, guide my hand. Moon Knight throws himself upward with a powerful uppercut, knocking the priestess out, almost knocking himself up in a sudden movement. He then stands dazed, looking around, asking, where did the creatures go? Or were they ever here? I I don't suppose you're going to tell me, will you? He turns to leave and the priestess reaches out, telling him that she tried to welcome him. All are welcome. But is his faith so narrow-minded? Can his God and hers not coexist? Does he not have anything to say to her? Moon Knight walks by a set of torches, telling her, I do, actually. Run. He knocks the rack over and within moments the entire building catches fire and all of the followers stand outside smiling. But over in the alleyway, Khonshu helps Moon Knight up, now that he has finally devoted himself to Khonshu again. Don't worry, everything will be alright now. And there you have it, the Moon Knight from 2013 series that everyone rants and raves about in its completion right here at the Comic Storian channel. If you want to get more of this, make sure you go click the link down below and go buy these issues yourself to get more context, more stuff going on, and more artwork. Thank you to Warren Ellis, Brian Wood, and Cullen Bunn for writing these amazing chapters. I hope you liked it, and I'll see you next time right here at Comic Story.